Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Today on our show, we have Pastor John Burke, who is the author of several books, including his New York Times bestseller called Imagine Heaven, Near-Death Experiences, God's Promises, and the Exhilarating Future that Awaits You. In this book, he compares over 100 stories of near-death experiences to what Scripture says about our biggest questions of heaven. John is also the lead pastor of Gateway Church in Austin, Texas, which he and his wife Kathy founded in 1998. He has a passion for creating a come-as-you-are culture in the church that gives people a church home where they can become all God intended them to be. He is the founder and president of the nonprofit organization Gateway Leadership Initiative and has spoken in over 20 countries to over 200,000 people. Coming to us from his home today in Texas, I'd like to say, Pastor John Burke, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Oh, thanks, Sandra. And you can just call me John. I can just I call you John. John. Yeah. All right. Well, John, nice to have you. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Oh, I'm thrilled to have you. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself? I, I did a little snooping on um, some of your <laughs> past interviews, but I don't want to let anything out so well let's tell us yeah, a little bit about you i mean i don't know if you grew up the good christian man and always believed in god and no not life exactly. after death. how does it all begin for you um well yeah i um actually imagine heaven uh started 35 years ago and it's it's kind of interesting because it actually began with my dad's death my dad was dying of cancer and i was a skeptic um you know, I had, had a little church background, just enough to inoculate me <laughs> and make me say, I don't know if I believe this stuff. You know, it, uh, right. I, I, I was, I was a, you know, I ended up studying engineering, becoming an engineer. So I have a very analytical mind. I like to know why I, I, I'm always questioning. And, uh, and I had a lot of questions and it didn't seem like anybody could really answer my questions or, or t- wanted to. Um, so I was skeptical uh, about God, about Jesus, the whole deal. And my dad is dying of cancer. And uh, I saw a book on his nightstand uh, called uh, Life After Life. It was the first book that coined the term near-death experience. Yeah, by Raymond Moody. Yeah, and I picked it up and I read it in one sitting that night. And at the end of it, I said, oh my gosh, Jesus, you're real. That, that's, that was what I, I said. And, and because so many people had in the book talked about when they died, when their, their heart stopped or their, you know, brain waves ceased. And yet they came alive like they had never come alive before. And so many of them, uh, saw this brilliant man of light. Uh, many of them knew to be Jesus. Others, you know, didn't know, but knew God. And, um, and it, it was enough to kind of shake my skepticism to go, I need to find out more. Yes. And so, you know, that really started me on a, on a spiritual search. And uh, as you said, I mean, uh, it's been years now. It's been 35 years. And uh, that led me from engineering uh, actually into ministry. And Kathy, my wife, and I started a church really for skeptics and doubters like me. Uh, that, I love that. Yeah, I mean, Gateway Church was created uh, for people like me. And it's, it is funny because uh, as we were talking about a little bit before the broadcast, I'm, I'm an, a musician and an engineer, this weird mix. But that is Austin. Austin is the live music capital of the world, and it's full of high-tech engineers. So our church is, uh, you know, for people like me who uh, have questions and doubts and struggles, but but are open-minded and willing to seek. I love uh, that. Yeah. So, so Imagine Heaven actually started, you know, 35 years ago uh, when I began this spiritual journey. And since then, I've read or studied or interviewed about a thousand uh, near-death experiences. And at the same time, you know, I've been to seminary and I've, I've studied the Bible in depth and, and taught it. And... I decided to try to bring the two together and take, you know, what I started to see is these thousand stories are actually showing us, they're giving a, our imagination um, a way to picture what 
what I think the Bible's promised all along. Most people I find have a horrible view of heaven. Yeah. I mean, you know, like sitting around on clouds, listening to harp music and, you know, wish you brought a magazine. Um, and, and I did too. And what I've found is, no, it is, it is life and it's life like we've always meant for it to be. Uh, and so seeing all these, I, I decided to write, um, about it. And it just so happened that I finished the manuscript, um, as my mom was dying. So kind of two strange bookends. And, um, my mom had, had been through Alzheimer's and she couldn't even feed herself. We had to feed her and wow. she had, she hadn't recognized us in a couple of years. And, um, and she was dying. She was in the hospital and my sister and I took turns, uh, you know, being with her. And while we did, I read the manuscript to my mom and to my sister. And, um, and at the end, my sister said, I want to go with her. <laughs> and I said, no, nope, you can't because <laughs> God's got a purpose for you here still. Um, but it was such a beautiful thing because, you know, as, as we'll talk about when you, when you die, you come alive. Uh, and, and many times the person is still there in the room. Um, and that's how so many skeptical doctors and other skeptics have been convinced. Um, it's what convinced me that this is real and there really is life after death. And so we, we waited and we were there. Uh, when my mom breathed her last and my sister and I were hugging each other and we were blessing her because we knew in that moment, you know, we hadn't really been able to talk for years. And yet we knew in that moment, you know, she would be there uh, more alive than ever before and, and hear us just blessing her for, you know, she was a single mom to us for many years and just, you know, wanted to tell her how grateful we were. So it was kind of a, an amazing bookend of my, my father's death and my mom's death. And actually I, I like to say their their uh, their graduation. <laughs> yeah. And you know what I'm hearing in this? I mean, I witnessed my dad passing away with cancer, and it was just brutal. And just mm -hmm. hearing once you've had the belief and you read the manuscript to your mom and your sister, it just sounds like it was a whole different kind of experience. Just knowing, I mean, it's sad. We miss the person, miss the body, but just knowing where she's going and that she's yeah. fine. You can't take away grief, you know, we can't, we have to go through grief because, you know, there is, there is something wrong in this world. You know, we feel it, we know there's something missing and, and, and to be separated, even if for a short amount of time for, from our loved ones, it does cause grief and you can't get around that, but there's hope. There can be hope in that grief because, um, you know, as I'm trying to show in Imagine Heaven, this life is, is not the end, it's the beginning. It's the introduction to the first chapter of the real life that we were intended to live. And that's what people consistently say when they, when they clinically die and yet are resuscitated. Right, right. So in Imagine Heaven, I've, you know, what, I've, what I've tried to do is look at the commonalities that you see um, across the thousand near-death experiences I studied in different cultures, different age groups, um, and it's amazingly consistent. And it's amazing the way it lines up, like I said, with what the what I have found the Bible has been teaching all along. But people don't take the time to really study it or really imagine it. And so, as a result, you know, we we don't really live this life to the fullest because we don't realize there's really nothing we don't need to fear. We don't need to be anxious and we don't need to worry so much, you know, it, it gives you a bigger perspective. Yeah, I feel that when we don't have a fear of death, we don't need to have a fear of life. We can take more healthy risks. We can express our love. We can go after our dreams. You know, we can never Absolutely. fail. Yeah. What are some of these commonalities you found? A thousand near death experiences is quite a lot, John. Yeah, I I, I, I only included a hundred, but <laughs> but what I was trying to do is um, when you when you see and hear through the the hundred or so people that I that I put in the book and, and I let you hear through their words, what you begin to see is this panoramic picture of what heaven is going to be like, and by the end, you feel a little bit like you've been there. Um, the first commonality is that people come alive, like I said. So 
Um, I, I write in chapter two of Imagine Heaven about skeptical doctors in the afterlife. And like I said, what convinced so many skeptical doctors is that when people die, they say they, they, they actually left their bodies, but they were still themselves and they were there present in the room actually watching uh, the resuscitation events. Yes. So like one, um, one cardiologist uh, uh, Dr. Michael Sabum, who I uh, interviewed, he said that he didn't believe in, uh, he didn't think there was anything as, such as a near-death experience. He said, but then um, he asked one of his patients, Pete, if anything happened during his cardiac arrest. And, and he, then he said, Pete uh, told me he had left his body during this first cardiac arrest and had watched the resuscitation. Sabum said, when I asked him to tell me what exactly he saw, he described the resuscitation with such detail and accuracy, I could have later used it to take uh, the tape to teach physicians. Wow. And he talks about how he began to interview more and more. And he said, these people like Pete Morton, um, you know, saw details of the re- resuscitation they could not otherwise have seen. One patient noticed the physician who failed to wear uh, scuffs over his white shoes during open heart surgery. He said, in many cases, I was able to go back and confirm the patient's testimony with the medical records and the hospital staff. And, and we see this again and again. Um, uh, Dr. Pim Van Lommel uh, in Holland uh, actually published, oh, and, and uh, Sabum published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Uh, so he published his findings. Uh, Dr. Pim Van Lommel reads about them in, um, in Holland and he starts asking some of his patients, and one that he talks about was published in The Lancet, which is kind of the, the uh, premier journal of uh, medicine in Europe, uh, where a guy came into the hospital, and he had been unconscious. He wasn't breathing. His heart had stopped. And so they start CPR, and the nurse noticed that he had dentures. And so they took his dentures out before ventilating him and put it in the lower drawer of the crash cart. Um, he, his heart started beating, but he never became conscious in the ER. They moved him out of the room, and he was unconscious for a week in this other room. When he comes to, he recognizes the nurse who, uh, and says, that's the nurse who knows where my dentures are. That's the nurse that put my dentures in the lower drawer of the crash car. Wow. Because they couldn't find his dentures. And so these, these stories are actually very common, that when people die, we leave our bodies, but we feel more alive than we've ever felt before. Not just with five senses, but they talk about how it's more like you have 50 senses. It's like you are super alive. Like, and, and one of the other commonalities is people don't want to come back um, because this life ends up feeling more like the shadow, and that feels like the concrete, real existence we were intended for. Yes. Now, I talk about how um, I believe in, in, in the Bible, Paul, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul, who wrote a good chunk of the New Testament, um, he actually was uh, a skeptic as well and was arresting Christians and throwing them in prison. You know, he was a Jewish rabbi. And, um, but, at, but at one point, well, he has this uh, encounter with this brilliant man of light, who that's another commonality of these near-death experiences, and that turns him around, you know, uh, this encounter with Jesus, it turns him around and, you know, he goes uh, around, uh, you know, starting churches across the Mediterranean. Well, at one point, um, a crowd turns on him and, it, and they stone him to death. And it says they stoned Paul and dragged him out of town thinking he was dead. But as the believers gathered around him, he got up and went back into the town. And I actually believe Paul had a near-death experience. I mean, he was dead enough to drag him out and leave him for dead. And then he gets back up and runs back in. Now, personally, I wouldn't go back into the town that just stoned me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he does. And then he later, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 2, um, talking about himself, he says, I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether, whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. But I know I was caught up into paradise and heard things so astounding they cannot be expressed in words, things no human is allowed to tell. And I think he's talking about how what, what people who have had near-death experiences say that, like, uh, they still had a body. So he didn't know if he was in his body or out of body because he felt alive. Um, and, and that is one of the commonalities. 
another one is that we see each other. We're ourselves. We recognize each other. There's this incredible reunion, this welcoming committee uh, many times there to greet us and welcome us. And there are most commonly our friends and our relatives, uh, those who have gone on before us. That's so happy to have yeah. that visual. Well, it's, you know, I mean, I, I like to say it like this. You know, I, I think um, I think it's ironic that people, I find people fear heaven um, and fear God many times as in a, you know, a, a, a just want to push them away um, because somehow they they think he wants to take love and take relation from us. And yet nothing could be further from the truth. Mm-hmm. You know, God created us for love first with himself. I mean, that's what Jesus taught, that if you love God with all you've got and then love people, that sums up all the commands of the Bible. It sums it all up right there. And so to think that heaven, where things are finally where God's will is done, you know, Jesus taught us, to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he taught us to pray that because his will is not always done on earth, um, but it is in heaven. So to think that where God's will is done, we would somehow be less uh, alive, less ourselves, less loving, less uh, relational, doesn't make any sense. And yet I find that's the common view people have. But what near-death experiences teach us is that, no, it's a big reunion. It's a huge celebration. That you know, is like, so great. Yeah. And, I mean, Jesus said this. He said this to, to, to his closest friends the night before his crucifixion. Uh, he said, look, don't, don't be troubled. He said, there's, there's more than enough room in my father's home, and I'm going to prepare a place for you when everything is ready. I'll come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And he talked about how we're going to drink wine and we're going to eat and we're going to celebrate. It's going to be this party. And I mean, how many people really think about heaven uh, as a party? Not too many. Not too many, right? I mean, most people think of heaven as, as an extended eternal church service. Yes. You know, that sounds bad to me and I'm a pastor. Right, all right. right. So, you know, that's not it. It's going to be life. Jesus said it's going to be abundant life. Um, and, and I think that's the, uh, that's the hope that we, we have really is we were meant to be together. We were meant to love God and we were meant to love others. And, yes. and that's really what heaven is all about. But it's not less life and it's not going to be boring. No, I don't think so. And from what you mentioned about people that you, you've interviewed, I've interviewed a bunch of people that have had the near-death experience. And they say that there are no words to fully describe the experience and there is so much intense wonderful unconditional love and a few yeah. of them have tried to explain it and you know and that even their explanations fill me with love just to even imagine that well exactly and that that's what i was trying to do in imagine heaven because i had read and studied all these stories and and what the scripture says and i I felt like people don't have this view, and until you hear it, you you know if you've if you've interviewed enough, you've you've heard them struggling for words, you know, like um, they'll say, I mean, there was time, but I don't know if it lasted eternity or a second, right? Right, and and that's exactly what Peter said in in, in Second Peter three nine. He said. To the Lord, uh, a, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. They talk about colors and this light that is beyond the, the spectrum of light that we have here on earth. Um, colors that just mesmerize and way beyond our color spectrum. And light that is palpable. Um, light that conveys love and light that conveys life. Uh, and, and here's what I find fascinating. So, um, I, I interviewed three blind people that I put in Imagine Heaven. Wow, okay. And blind people, when they have a cardiac arrest, when they die, they can see. And, and they're trying to describe uh, the, the same thing. Um, but listen to this. So, so Vicky is one uh, a blind person. She had a b- bad car accident, flatlined. And she was watching the doctors uh, working on her. And thought to herself, is that my body down there? Am I dead or what? She was trying to figure it out because, you know, and, and she was trying to d- 
differentiate what she had felt and known because that's how she had known things from this perception she was getting. And um, she kept trying to get their attention. And of course, she couldn't. And they were afraid she was going to lose her hearing. And, and finally, she said, I thought, I'm out of here. I can't get these people to listen to me. And as soon as she thought that, she said, I went up through the ceiling as if it was nothing. And it was wonderful to be out there and to be free and not worry about bumping into anything. And she said, I knew where I was going. She finds herself going up through this dark enclosure, she said, like, like a tube. And it's interesting because another blind guy didn't, he, he said all of a sudden there was color and then there was no color. And he said, I wondered if that was darkness. So going up through this passageway or this tube or tunnel or pathway, people describe it differently. I, I, uh, I talk about an imagined heaven. Maybe this is like a wormhole from our dimensional space into God's multidimensional space. I don't know. Right. And so, they, so Vicky comes out into this place of tremendous light. Vicky said the light was something you could feel as well as see. And even the people she saw were, were bursting with light. She said everybody there was made of light. And, it was, and I was made of light. And what the light conveyed was love. There was love everywhere. It was like love came out of the grass. Love came out of the birds. Love came out of the trees. It was incredible, really beautiful. And I was overwhelmed by that experience because I couldn't really imagine what, what light was like. It's still a very emotional thing when I talk about it, she sure. says. And then w- what's amazing is Vicky um, uh, and other blind people describe light coming out of things in heaven. Now, where would they ever get that idea? Because light shines on things. Yes. You don't ever, we don't talk about light coming out of things and light conveying love and life. And yet I, I interview a, uh, a, a doctor, um, Dr. Mary Neal, a spine surgeon, uh, a, another, a pastor, uh, a TWA airline pilot, a bank president, who are all saying the same thing, that in heaven light comes out of everything and it's palpable. It, it has life and love in it. Now, here's the fascinating thing. That's exactly what John says in the book of Revelation. It's also what Isaiah says in the Old Testament, mm. that in heaven there is no sun or moon because the light, the glory or light of God is the light of heaven, and people will walk in that light. And, and here's another fascinating thing. Daniel, uh, another Old Testament prophet in Daniel 12, 2, says the dead will rise up, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting disgrace, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. That's beautiful. It's what they're, it's exactly what they're saying they experienced. But think about this. I mean, blind people, and not, not a few, a lot, saying that they see and then describing the, the same things. Um, Brad was a, an eight year old kid, um, living in the Boston Center for the Blind. And he says almost the same exact thing. And in fact, he talks about going up this beautiful meadow, palm trees and light coming out of everything. And the light was palpable, he said. And he describes coming up to this wall. Now, he does. I don't think he even knows what it is because he he never mentions. But I, I correlate the wall that he's talking about that he said was shining with its own particular light. And it looked like gemstones. And I show how a TWA airline pilot um, is talking about the same wall flying into this city, the city of God that John describes in Revelation 21. And I used to read that Revelation 21, and it kind of sounded, you know, like uh, pearly gates and streets of gold. And it just sounded like a bad televangelist set to me. You know what I'm talking about? It was like... Ooh, it just, you know, it sounds like you're trying too hard. Yeah. Um, but here's what I've since realized is John was trying to describe something that is otherworldly. But as you mentioned, they're all trying to use terms that are three dimensional and it just doesn't quite cut it. And so I correlate how, how what John is describing, um, the wall and, and, and the, the gate, it's not a gate. It's, it's a pearlescent kind of material that's an otherworldly substance. And this doctor, spine surgeon, and this TWA airline pilot and this blind eight-year-old kid are describing the same wall and the same gate into the city that they're going into. 
It's fascinating. I mean, it's just, it blows your mind. You're like, oh my gosh, what would, because you, ha you have to sit there and go, all right, these are, these are, cre and I've interviewed these people personally. I know them. Yeah, they're credible individuals. These are credible people who have nothing to gain. I mean, you know, most of them are millionaires. They don't need to go write fantastic books about heaven. It's going to, it's going to mar their profession because they're, you know, other doctors are going to be like, you're crazy, right? And yet they're all saying the same, the same thing, thing from different angles. Yeah. And it really is. It's like, it's like, uh, you know, if you had a car accident and you got different people on different corners, they would be telling what they saw and heard. And after you heard all of them, you'd start to piece it together and see a three dimensional, you know, representation. And that's really what I'm trying to do in Imagine Heaven is show that picture that I've been able to see, you know, or imagine uh, because of these testimonies. You know what it's, it's exciting for me is, um, long ago when I first started talking about my book, I was so afraid what people would think of me. And then I talked about it a little bit. And next thing you know, when I started interviewing people that had scientific backgrounds and medical backgrounds and stuff, it made it more credible. Mm -hmm. So people weren't afraid people would think that, you know, they're one of these wacky woo woo people out there. And I, and I'm kind of hearing the same thing through you in relation to the Bible, because I know, um, I personally have held back on sharing some of my stuff with people that I don't know well that are um, heavy-duty religious, shall I say. Yeah. Because I know there's been people, even emails that I've gotten, that's saying, you know, the, this is against the Bible. You know, talking well, about this life and I talk, that stuff. Yeah, and I deal with that. I deal with that. you sure. got to remember something. Um, the religious crucified Jesus. Oh, yeah. How about that? <laughs> yeah. You got to remember this. Uh, so, so here's the thing is that don't, uh, and, and, you know, this, this was something I had to work through. And it's, it's part of why we started Gateway Church, you know, for, uh, to be a, a come as you are place where, you know, we say no perfect people allowed and doubters are welcome. And the reason is, is because so many people have gotten such a negative view of the God of the Bible and have not really taken the time to dive in and read the New Testament for themselves, read the, the prophets for themselves because of Christians who quite honestly, many times are not following Jesus at all. Right. And, and, and you do have to remember that, yes, religion, but not just religion, anything. We, we are addicted to playing God. I believe this is really, um, you know, AA talks about um, addictions right. and how really the, the number one sin is that we play God. And then we try to get everyone and everything to do our will. What do you mean by playing God? Well, just that. Uh, all of us are, we spend most of our time, if we're honest, getting up saying, how can I have my will be done today? Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and how can I get you to obey my will and even God? And by the way, if God doesn't do things the way I expect, I'm going to get mad at him. It's all about me. <laughs> Attitude. It is. And, and, and you know, that's what, that's what Jesus was showing us is he came to live as a human to show us the love of God and show us a human who had wonderful boundaries. He was not a pushover. But he could choose to love and serve others, even to the point of laying down his life. Mm -hmm. And he showed us an other-centered love. You know, he didn't do miraculous things to prove himself to others. He did them to show the, the love and the mercy of God in a broken, hurting world that turns away from God. And more often goes our way than God's way. But he, you know, it, I mean, the claims of Jesus is that he came to pay for all our wrongs and all our debts. And this is the great liberating truth, you know, that I'm so passionate about is that we don't need to fear death and we don't need to fear God. And what causes us to is that deep down, we all know we screw up, you know, I yeah, mean, we do. Yeah. I, I, gosh, you know, I've got, I've got a long, long list, you know, <laughs> and, and, and I don't even know what God knows. Right. But, but God created us for love. He created us for relationship. And that actually is what makes sense. I, I do a whole chapter on no more pain or sorrow or suffering. 
And that the only thing I can find that makes sense of all the pain and the sorrow and the suffering of this earth is if the main point is that we were created to love God. And the reason is, is because love can't be forced. It can't be coerced. No. You know, you can't put a gun to someone's head and make them love you. You can make them parrot the words, I love you, you know, but that's not real love. And we all know it. And, and God can't force our love either. So God has created people that can truly choose to reject him and go our own way. And I think it, it, it plays itself out. And we see, you know, not God's will be done, but my will be done, which is why Jesus taught us to pray the opposite, right? Your will be done. And it was his last prayer, not my will. His will is, I don't want to suffer. I mean, as a, as, you know, he, as a human, he didn't want to go through that suffering of the cross. But he said, but not my will, your will be done. And for the sake of others, he did that. So I think the liberating message of the Bible is that God is for us. He's not against us. Um, and, and so many people think he's against us. He is, he's the one who created you. He is crazy about you. This is the other thing that I feel like. Um, I love that. He's crazy about me. No, he is. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> God, Everybody take that in who's listening. God's and crazy God is a very emotional you. God. You know, it, it, one of the things that uh, in chapters 9 through 12, I write about, you know, who is this brilliant being, this brilliant God of light that people see all over the globe? Mm -hmm. And the thing is, that the, the thing that's crazy is, I mean, in cultures all over the globe, when people die, many of them experience the presence of this brilliant man of light who is brighter than the sun, uh, who is love unconditional, knows our every thought, every deed, everything. And yet in his presence, they, they feel more alive than they've ever felt. They never want to leave his presence. And they're describing the one who Jesus, who said, I am the light of the world. It's the same one that Daniel, the Old Testament prophet, saw uh, by the Tigris River, who said his face flashed like lightning. You know, it was like bright as lightning. Um, Paul, as I said, was persecuting Christians, and he has this experience on the Damascus Road where this brilliant man of light says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you? And he said, I'm Jesus. And, and uh, the one you were persecuting. And, you know, Paul goes on, like I said, to, to start all these churches. John in the book of Revelation uh, talks about his eyes are like, um, he, he describes them like fire. But I've near-death experiencers have described the, looking into his eyes as like, like all the colors at once, um, but that just draw you in. And they feel like they know everything in an instant looking into his eyes. It's really interesting. I mean, it's... But, John, but the there's a little boy that I heard this story from a man I sat next to on an airplane. And his son, it sounded like he had a near-death experience. He drowned. They resuscitated him. And it was real scary for the father. And the father, uh, this is where uh, he got his faith. He just said, my son told me. He said, the big face in the sun told me I had to come back to you, daddy. And... And everything would be all right. And, you know, he said it in like three or four year old language. But I just keep right. remembering that big face in the sun. Yeah. And that's the thing is that, I mean, you know, children, uh, airline pilots, uh, people in the Middle East, people in India, um, they're seeing the same God. Uh, he's not impersonal. He is this brilliant uh, being of light. And actually, uh, they'll say, not male or female, just God. Um, but at the same time, people who, who, people who know Jesus seem to know he's Jesus. And, and in his presence, they, they feel so known, so loved, um, never want to leave his presence. And another commonality is he gives them a life review. So they get to relive their lives like in a three-dimensional panoramic replay. Right. And, and, and again, time doesn't work the same way. So it's, they don't know if it's an instant or they relive the whole, all the years, but it's like that. And what's fascinating, again, is that people come back and what they, what they experienced well, let me read you. Uh, let me read you some of the things that they say. Can I? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so this one woman, 
said, I went through this dark black vacuum at super speed. You could compare it to a tunnel. I saw a bright light, and on my way there, I heard beautiful music and saw colors that I'd never seen before. Oh, the music is another one we got to talk about <laughs> that, okay. that blows your mind. She said, she comes into the presence of, she says, the pen, it was the pinnacle of everything there is, of energy, of love especially, but of warmth, of beauty. I was immersed in this feeling of total love. From the moment the light spoke to me, I felt really good, secure, and loved. The love which came from it was unimaginable, indescribable. And it was a fun person to be with. It definitely had a sense of humor. I never wanted to leave the presence of this being. My whole life so far appeared to be placed before me kind of like a panoramic three-dimensional review, and each event seemed to be accompanied by an awareness of good and evil or by an insight into its cause and effect. Throughout, I not only saw everything from my own point of view, but I knew the thoughts of everybody who I'd been involved with in these events, and throughout, the review stressed the importance of love. Now, this is amazingly common. Mm -hmm. That people experience this life review in the presence of this God of light and love. Um, and, and, and again, you know, Jesus said God is love. I mean, it's, it's who he is. And, and it's what Jesus came to show us, that, that love lays down his life for us. There's nothing he wouldn't do for us. And in the presence of this God of love, they re-experience all their interactions with people and what they all come back realizing is that love is the point of it all. And they experience their little acts of kindness, but they also experience their unkind acts, and they experience how it affected the people around them and the ripple effect that it has through humanity. That's incredible. And it's profound, mm -hmm. and it profoundly changes the way people live. And I got to tell you, it's profoundly changed the way I live. I mean, a big part of why I, I, you know, I was willing to, leave engineering and, you know, take a third of my salary to, to try to, uh, you know, minister to people uh, who were doubters and skeptics and addicts and, you know, uh, you know feeling the, the hurts and the wounds of life uh, is because I just, it changed what life is about to me. Um, you know, there was another uh, a pastor that I, um, I quote in Imagine Heaven. Um, it, and and it was a good reminder for me too because you know I I lead a large church thousands of people and he did too and you know in everything in life it's so easy to get lost you know I mean hey I'm far from perfect you know and even knowing all this and studying all this it's like it's just so easy to get bruised and beat up and lost in life and um, I read uh, I read this guy's um, story what happened is. Um, you know, he's leading this big church doing lots of, lots of good stuff. Um, but he, he actually dies on the, on the operating table. Mm -hmm. And he said that he, he rose above his body and he's watching, uh, the operation. And God is there with him, this brilliant being of light. And he says, God gave me a number of life altering, unforgettable messages that I'll take to my grave. Some I can share, some are more personal. We did not communicate just with words, but also with memories and images. Oh, by the way, that's another one. The communication of heaven is perfect. It's thought to thought. It's complete. And it's, it's feelings, it's memories, it's images, it's everything. Great. He says, um, God let me know just how much he valued me. It's almost impossible to describe the perfect sense of acceptance that surrounded me. Yet even in the midst of this very personal embrace, part of me knew that not everything in my life had matched what God had intended for me. Despite my list of fiascos, God extended his total acceptance and absolute love to me and showed me how he's going to give me another chance. I got the sense that God was going to give me an opportunity to let go of the things that had become idols in my life and allow me to begin to embrace people instead. I was to become the husband and father I was supposed to be. Right there in the ICU ward, I realized I didn't even know the names of any of my children's friends. Here's the, what he actually, and what he said was, he said, God asked me, what are the names of your children's best friends? And he said he was sitting there watching his operation, listening to this, and just stuck. Like, and he said, you know, my, my, my children's friends had been over all the time, but I'm a busy, important pastor. I, you know, I was nice to them. 
but he didn't, he didn't really, know their names. But he didn't even know their names. And God, the God he worshipped and was leading others to worship and follow, asked him that simple question. You know, and this this is the thing. This is the thing that's really changed me. You know, we all want to change the world in, yeah. in our own way. We want to matter. Yes, we want, we want our lives to matter. Jesus said, "If we will love God and love your neighbor as much as you do yourself." then you fulfill the, the, the essence of your purpose. You know, I think that also includes using our gifts mm-hmm. um, to, to serve humanity, to do good for humanity. But, but um, you know, what, what you start to realize, and uh, there's another guy, Howard Storm, who he was actually an atheist professor um, who had a life review. And, and, it, and he talks about how, um, you know, how... Jesus basically shows him this plan of how you love the people around you and it'll change the world. And he was kind of, he was, he said, I was kind of questioning Jesus about it. Like, oh, come on, that's not going to work. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and what he, what he realized was um, it's the ripple effect of humanity. God doesn't need us to change the world. He needs us to love the people around us. And when we all do that, that does change the world. Mm, I heard somebody say once, love and fear can't be present at the same time. Mm -hmm. But we can definitely turn on love. And it's so easy. You can always find something about the person you're with to love. I have a question for you, though, just because I I got an unsettling uh, email which I think I answered the best I could. But if heaven is so great, okay, and if in this particular case, this woman had two children that had died in an accident and her husband, mm-hmm. and I even think a, a parent, uh, one of her parents passed away too, and all she wanted to do was fast forward and get to heaven. So as yeah. great as it may be, I am of a belief that our earth life is for a purpose. Can you touch on Absolutely. that a little bit. Yeah. And let me just say too, um, we are not to take our own lives. Uh, that is, that is absolutely. And, uh, uh, you know, people who have and have had near death experiences and came back realized that was the biggest mistake they could have possibly made. Because again, that's the ultimate act of playing God rather than trusting God of saying, I can determine when a life has purpose or not, even if it's my own, you know, and, and, and part of learning to love God and others is we've got to love ourselves. We've got to realize that God loves us. So we are of value. We are of worth to him and we have purpose. He created us and he created us for a purpose. Now, I, I found it interesting to realize that though everybody um, who had this life review knew and saw very clearly that truth, that they have a purpose, that God has a purpose. And so many times God would say to people, your, your purpose is not complete yet. You've got to go back. And yet they still struggled with it. And I, I don't know. Personally, I find that encouraging. Yes. <laughs> that that it's not, it's not like, oh, I get it. You know, there's, and now there's no struggle and it's just like all obvious. No. No, there, there is a struggle still of, of just realizing, okay, how do I, you know, how do I just walk day by day being faithful with the gifts I've given to, to love and serve God and the people he's put around me? Right. You know, or, you know, if you're a doctor, how to use my gifts, you know, not just to serve myself, but to really heal people and care about the patients. Mm-hmm. You know, that was what Howard Storm learned, uh, you know, that, that, he was he was obsessed with being a great professor and artist, but Jesus was concerned with how he treated his students. Mm-hmm. And I think I think you know keeping that in mind. The the other thing that's so incur- incredibly encouraging about that, we can all succeed. You know, look, most of us, most of us will not succeed by the world's definition. Like we're not. Most of us are not going to be super super wealthy or super famous or celebrities or well known fitness right? perfect figure <laughs> it's not yeah. going to happen no and and you know i've traveled the world uh america you know we are the wealthiest most well to do 
the most educated. We, we do have it all and it's still not enough. Right. Right. So by that definition, that, that just drives us and leads us to insanity. But when you realize, and, and this is part of what I, I think, you know, the life review shows us is that we can all succeed not compared to each other, but compared to the unique path God has laid out for us. You know, some people start with, you know, a friend of mine, Kate, she, she has cerebral palsy. You know, her struggles and her challenges are completely different than mine. We both have them. Right. But she can succeed and, and, and radically be uh, exactly what God wants her to be. And she is. Um, by the world's definition, she'll never succeed, but she will by God's definition. Mm-hmm. And, and on the other hand, we've got to be careful not to think we're conquering the world and we're something great and miss what God said is most important, to love God and to love people. Wow, that's really great. And I'm thinking, I live in a very small town north of Boston, and our small church that we had here just closed. Mm-hmm. And I think of all the different denominations, churches that close, and that you're in a thriving several thousand member church. You're doing something different. You're delivering a message that needs to be heard. You're encouraging people to love and to serve. You're giving them a home away from home. Um, And it's not just in Austin, Texas. Don't you have other branches of your Gateway Church? Um, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, they're not called Gateway. Okay, uh, there, there is another Gateway that is not affiliated with us. That was that was my my yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we we have yeah we've helped start um, uh, other churches and you know really that's that's part of I I travel around the world um, teaching church leaders really um, how to meet people where they're at. That's uh, and not and and not not play the religious games, but rather do what Jesus did. Jesus went, and uh, you know he was accused of being a friend of of tax collectors and sinners. You know he he was accused of of many things um, by the religious, and I think we've got to be careful not to cloister ourselves off uh, from caring and having compassion like Jesus did for a hurting, broken world that need to know. Like I said. That God created them for himself and everything we love about this life. I mean, everything wow. is a gift from God. And yet, just taste on the tip of our tongues mm-hmm. of the feast he has prepared for us. Mm, that's really great. How can people get in touch with you? I, time goes by so quick. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's almost top of the hour. <laughs> How can we find out more about you, your book, your church? John. Uh, well, uh, you can you can go to uh, imagineheaven.net or my um, that's that's the book site or johnburkonline.com um, is my uh, my website. Uh, gatewaychurch.com is uh, is our church's website, and you can uh, you can listen to past messages there. In fact, um, we did a series called Imagine Heaven. If you go into the message archives, and you can watch. Uh, many of the videos of these people that I talk about in the book, I, I interviewed them, you know, live during that. Oh, summer. that's wonderful. But, yeah. So I interviewed the doctor and the atheist professor and the um, TWA airline pilot and several others. So neat. Is, is your church one that somebody long distance can still participate? Yeah, we not? have an, we have an internet campus and we have communities all over the globe. Uh, we have a, a, a group that. That meets in Norway and Denmark and uh, wow. France and yeah, all over uh, Australia. So, well, really good stuff. I know that people love to belong. They love to feel gotten and understood. Um, we do love to love. I think is human. It's, it's in our nature. Yeah, wow. um, yeah, and to serve. And I think you've you've encompassed all of that and i really thank you um i wish i could go on and on do you have any closing words or if there's maybe just maybe one thing you could share if you're imagining somebody listening to this now and you know maybe there's one action step we could take today i don't know it doesn't have to be that but anything you're just drawn to say the final closing thought well you know it's the passion of my life is helping people know 
that there is no one who is a bigger fan of you than God, the one who created you for himself. And there's no one who will ever, ever love you more or that you will ever love more. And so seek him with all your heart. That's really beautiful. And for a single gal sitting at home by herself, that resonates. You know, it's some of us are single and or, or we've lost a lot of people close to us or whatever that is. Oh, yeah. 50, 50% of our church is single. Oh, I should come to Austin. Austin Anyways. <laughs> yeah, actually, Austin, Austin's a 60% single city. <laughs> hey, now. That's a whole other, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Anyways, it's just really great. And when you said that how much we're loved, it just, it, like, that really resonated with me. And I just went, oh, I mean, it, it, hit, it hit home as the truth. And that's beautiful. <laughs> just beautiful. Well, John Burke, thank you, thank you, thank you for being our guest today. Thanks for having me on, Sandra. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And for our listener, thank you once again for taking the time to listen. You know me. I, I want to get to have great conversations that empower all of us to have our best day to day and to believe that there's nothing to fear in the hereafter, that our loved ones are still around, and we do have something great to look forward to. So our home base for this radio show is we don't die radio.com. And what else can I tell you? I think that's it. I, I just, I really enjoyed uh, our conversation. Uh, feel free to go to johnburkonline.com, imagineheaven.net, and gatewaychurch.com. And in closing, this is Sandra Champlain, and I have been your host on We Don't Die Radio. And with a big smile on my face, I do say and do believe that life is an education for our souls and that your life here on earth is important. You are loved more than you'll ever know. So I want to thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon.